Hello, my name is Gary, and I was raised in the Western United States, so I'm a native English speaker. I hope that you will enjoy this YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us. The Lord of the Rings Chapter 1 A Long Expected Party When Mr. Bilbo Baggins of Bag End announced that he would shortly be celebrating his 11th-1st birthday with party of special magnificence, there was much talk and excitement in Hobbit Town. Bilbo was very rich and very peculiar, and had been the wonder of the Shire for 60 years ever since his remarkable disappearance and unexpected return. The riches he had brought back from his travels had now become a local legend, and it was popularly believed, whatever the old folk might say, that the hill at Bag End was full of tunnels stuffed with treasure, and if that was not enough for fame, there was also his prolonged vigor to marvel at. Time wore on, but it seemed to have little effect on Mr. Baggins. At ninety, he was much the same as at fifty. At ninety-nine, they began to call him well-preserved but unchanged, would have been nearer the mark. There were some that shook their heads and thought this was too much of a good thing. It seemed unfair that anyone should possess apparently perpetual youth as well as reputedly inexhaustible wealth. It will have to be paid for, they said. It isn't natural, and trouble will come of it. But so far, trouble had not come. And as Mr. Baggins was generous with his money, most people were willing to forgive him his oddities and his good fortune. He remained on visiting terms with his relatives, except, of course, the Sackville Bagginses, and he had many devoted admirers among the hobbits of poor and unimportant families. But he had no close friends until some of his younger cousins began to grow up. The eldest of these, and Bilbo's favorite, was young Frodo Baggins, when Bilbo was ninety-nine, he adopted Frodo as his heir and brought him to live at Bag End, and the hopes of the Sackville Bagginses were finally dashed. Bilbo and Frodo happened to have the same birthday, September 22nd. You had better come and live here, Frodo, my lad, said Bilbo one day, and then we can celebrate our birthday parties comfortably together. At that time, Frodo was still in his tweens as the hobbits called the irresistible twenties between childhood and coming of age at thirty-three. Twelve more years passed. Each year, the Bagginses had given every lively combined birthday parties at Bag End. But now it was understood that something quite exceptional was being planned for that autumn. Bilbo was going to be eleven-ty-one, one hundred eleven, a rather curious number and a very respectable age for a hobbit. The old took himself had only reached 130, and Frodo was going to be 33, an important number, the date of his coming of age. Tongues began to wag in Hobbiton and Bywater, and rumor of the coming event traveled all over the Shire. The history and character of Mr. Bilbo Baggins became once again the chief topic of conversation, and the older folks suddenly found their reminiscences in welcome demand. No one had a more attentive audience than old Ham Gamgee, commonly known as the Gaffer. He held forth at the Ivy Bush, a small inn on the Bywater Road, and he spoke with some authority, for he had tended the garden at Bag End for forty years, and had helped the old Holman in the same job before that. Now that he was himself growing old and stiff in the joints, the job was mainly carried on by his youngest son, Sam Gamgee. Both father and son were on very friendly terms with Bilbo and Frodo. They lived on the hill itself in number three, Bagshot Road, just below Bag End. A very nice, well-spoken, gentle hobbit is Mr. Bilbo. As I've always said, the gaffer declared, with perfect truth for Bilbo, he was very polite to him, calling him Master Hamfast and consulting him constantly upon the growing of vegetables, and the matter of roots, especially potatoes, 
The gaffer was recognized as the leading authority by all in the neighborhood, including himself. But what about this Frodo that lives with him? Asked Old Noakes of Bywater. Baggins is his name, but he's more than half a brandy buck. They say it beats me why any Baggins habitant should go looking for a wife away there in Buckland, where folks are so queer. And no wonder they're queer, put in Daddy Twofoot, the gaffer's next-door neighbor. If they live on the wrong side of the Brandywine River in the old forest, that's a dark, bad place, if half the tales be true. You're right, Dad, said the gaffer. Not that the brandy bucks of Buckland live in the old forest, but they're a queer breed, seemingly. They fool about with boats on that big river, and that isn't natural. Small wonder the trouble came of it, I say. But be that as it may, Mr. Frodo is as nice a young hobbit as you could wish to meet. Very much like Mr. Bilbo, and in more than looks. After all, his father was a Baggins. A decent, respectable hobbit was Mr. Drogo Baggins. There was ever much to tell of him till he was drowned. Drowned? said several voices. They had heard this and other darker rumors before, of course, but hobbits have a passion for family history, and they were ready to hear it again. Well, so they say, said the gaffer. You see, Mr. Drogo, he married poor Miss Primula Brandybuck. She was our Mr. Bilbo's first cousin on the mother's side, her mother being the youngest of the old Took's daughters, and Mr. Drogo was his second cousin. So Mr. Frodo is his first and second cousin, once removed, either way, as the saying is, if you follow me. And Mr. Drogo was staying at Brandy Hall with his father-in-law, old master Gorbadoc, as he often did after his marriage. And he went out boating on the Brandywine River, and he and his wife were drowned, and poor Mr. Frodo only a child at all. I've heard that they went on the water after dinner in the moonlight said old Noakes, and it was Drogo's weight as sunk the boat. And I heard she pushed him in, and he pulled her in after him, said Sandy Man, the Hobbiton Miller. You shouldn't listen to all you hear, Sandy Man, said the gaffer, who did not much like the Miller. There isn't no call to go talking of pushing and pulling. Boats are quite tricky enough for those that sit still without looking further for the cause of trouble. Anyway, there was this Mr. Frodo left an orphan and stranded, as you might say, among those queer Bucklanders, being brought up anyhow in Brandy Hall, a regular warren by all accounts. Old Master Gorbadoc never had fewer than a couple of hundred relations in the place. Mr. Bilbo never did a kinder deed than when he brought the lad back to live among decent folk but I reckon it was a nasty knock for those Snackville Bagginses. They thought they were going to get Bag End that time when he went off and was thought to be dead. And then he comes back and orders them off, and he goes on living and living and never looking a day older, bless him. And suddenly he produces an heir and has all the papers made out proper. The Slackville Bagginses won't never see the inside of Bag End now, or it is to be hoped not. There's a tidy bit of money tucked away up there. I hear tell, said a stranger, a visitor on business from Michael Delvey in the West Farthing. All the top of your hill is full of tunnels packed with chests of gold and silver and jewels, by what I've heard. Then you've heard more than I can speak to, answered the gaffer. I know nothing about jewels. Mr. Bilbo is free with his money, and there seems no lack of it. But I know of no tunnel-making. I saw Mr. Bilbo when he came back a matter of sixty years ago, when I was a lad. I'd not long come prentice to old Holman, him being my dad's cousin. But he had me up at Bag End, helping him to keep folks from trampling all over the garden while the sale was on. 
And in the middle of it all, Mr. Bilbo comes up the hill with a pony and some mighty big bags and a couple of chests. I don't doubt they were mostly full of treasure he had picked up in foreign parts, where there be mountains of gold, they say, but there wasn't enough to fill tunnels. But my lad Sam will know more about that. He's in and out of Bag End, crazy about stories of the old days. He is, and he listens to all Mr. Bilbo's tales. Mr. Bilbo has learned him his letters, meaning no harm, mark you, and I hope no harm will come of it. Elves and dragons, I says to him, cabbages and potatoes are better for me and you. Don't go getting mixed up in the business of your betters, or you'll land in trouble too big for you, I says to him. And I might say it to others, he added with a look at the stranger and the miller. But the gaffer did not convince his audience. The legend of Bilbo's wealth was now too firmly fixed in the minds of the younger generation of hobbits. Ah, oh, but he has likely enough been adding to what he brought at first, argued the miller, voicing common opinion. He's often away from home. And look at the outlandish folk that visit him. Dwarves coming at night, and that old wandering conjurer Gandalf and all. You can say what you like, Gaffer, but Bag End's a queer place, and its folks are queerer. And you can say what you like about what you know no more of than you do of boating, Mr. Sandyman, reported the Gaffer, disliking the miller even more than usual. If that's being queer, then we could do with a bit more queerness in these parts. Our Sam says that everyone's going to be invited to the party, and there's going to be presents, mark you, presents for all, this very month as is. That very month was September, and as fine as you could ask, a day or two later, a rumor probably started by the knowledgeable Sam was spread about that there were going to be fireworks. Fireworks. What is more, such as had not been seen in the Shire for nigh on a century, not indeed since the old Took died. Days passed, and the day drew nearer. An odd-looking wagon laden with odd-looking packages rolled into the Hobbit town one evening and toiled up the hill to Bag End. The startled hobbits peered out of lamplit doors to gape at it. It was driven by outlandish folk, singing strange songs, dwarfs with long beards and deep hoods. A few of them remained at Bag End. At the end of the second week in September, a cart came in through Bywater from the direction of Brandywine Bridge in broad daylight. An old man was driving it all alone. He wore a tall pointed blue hat, a long gray cloak, and a silver scarf. He had a long white beard and brushy eyebrows that stuck out beyond the brim of his hat. Small hobbit children ran after the cart, all through Hobbiton and right up the hill. It had a cargo of fireworks, as they rightly guessed. At Bilbo's front door, the old man began to unload. There were great bundles of fireworks, of all sorts and shapes, each labeled with a large red G and the elf rune. That was Gandalf's mark, of course, and the old man was Gandalf the wizard, whose fame in the Shire was due mainly to his skill with fires, smokes, and lights. His real business was far more difficult and dangerous, but the Shire folk knew nothing about it. To them, he was just one of the attractions at the party. Hence the excitement of the hobbit children. G for grand, they shouted, and the old man smiled. They knew him by sight, though he only appeared in Hobbiton occasionally and never stopped long. But neither they nor any but the oldest of their elders had seen one of his firework displays. They now belonged to a legendary past. When the old man, helped by Bilbo and some dwarves, had finished unloading, Bilbo gave a few pennies away, but not a single squib or cracker was forthcoming, to the disappointment of the onlookers. Run away now, said Gandalf. You will get plenty when the time comes. Then he disappeared inside with Bilbo, and the door was shut. 
The young hobbit stared at the door in vain for a while, and then made off, feeling that the day of the party would never come. Inside Bag End, Bilbo and Gandalf were sitting at the open window of a small room, looking out west onto the garden. The late afternoon was bright and peaceful. The flowers glowed red and golden, snapdragons and sunflowers and nasturtiums trailing all over the turf walls and peeping in at the round windows. How bright your garden looks, said Gandalf. Yes, said Bilbo. I am very fond indeed of it, and of all the dear old shire, but I think I need a holiday. You mean to go on with your plan, then? I do. I made up my mind months ago, and I haven't changed it. Very well. It is no good saying any more. Stick to your plan, your whole plan, mind, and I hope it will turn out for the best for you and for all of us. I hope so. Anyway, I mean to enjoy myself on Thursday and have my little joke. Who will laugh, I wonder, said Gandalf, shaking his head. We shall see, said Bilbo. The next day, more carts rolled up the hill, and still more carts. There might have been some grumbling about dealing locally, but that very week, orders began to pour out of Bag End for every kind of provision, commodity, or luxury that could be obtained in Hobbiton or Bywater or anywhere in the neighborhood. People became enthusiastic, and they began to tick off the days on the calendar, and they watched eagerly for the postman, hoping for invitations. Before long, the invitations began pouring out, and the Hobbiton post office was blocked, and the Bywater post office was snowed under and voluntary assistant postmen were called for. There was a constant stream of them going up the hill, carrying hundreds of polite variations on, Thank you, I shall certainly come. A notice appeared on the gate at Bag End, no admittance except on party business. Even those who had or pretended to have party business were seldom allowed inside. Bilbo was busy. Writing invitations, ticking off answers, packing up presents, and making some private preparations of his own. From the time of Gandalf's arrival, he remained hidden from view. One morning, the hobbits woke to find the large field south of Bilbo's front door covered with ropes and poles and tents and pavilions. A special entrance was cut into the bank leading to the road, and wide steps and a large white gate were built there. The three hobbit families of Bagshot Row adjoining the field were intensely interested and generally envied. Old gaffer Gamgee stopped even pretending to work in his garden. The tents began to go up. There was a specially large pavilion, so big that the tree that grew in the field was right inside it and stood proudly near one end, at the head of the chief table. Lanterns were hung on all its branches more promising still to the hobbit's mind, an enormous open-air kitchen was erected in the north corner of the field. As draught of cooks from every end and eating house for miles around arrived to supplement the dwarves and other odd folk that were quartered at Bag End, excitement rose to its height. Then the weather clouded over. That was on Wednesday, the eve of the party. Anxiety was intense. Then Thursday, September the 22nd, actually dawned. The sun got up, the clouds vanished, flags were unfurled, and the fun began. Bilbo Baggins called it a party, but it was really a variety of entertainments rolled into one. Practically everybody living near was invited. A very few were overlooked by accident, but as they turned up all at the same, that did not matter. Many people from other parts of the Shire were also asked, and there were even a few from outside the borders. Bilbo met the guests and additions at the new white gate in person. He gave away presents to all and sundry. The latter were those who went out again by a back way and came in again by the gate. Hobbits give presents to other people on their own birthdays. Not very expensive ones as a rule, and not so lavishly as on this occasion. But it was not a bad system. Actually, in Hobbiton and Bywater, every day in the year was somebody's birthday, so that every hobbit in those parts had a fair chance of at least one present at least once a week. But they never got tired of them. On this occasion, the presents were unusually good. 
The hobbit children were so excited that for a while they almost forgot about eating. There were toys, the likes of which they had never seen before, all beautiful and some obviously magical. Many of them had indeed been ordered a year before and had come all the way from the mountain and from Dale and were of real dwarf make. When every guest had been welcomed and was finally inside the gate, there were songs, dances, music, games, and, of course, food and drink. There were three official meals, lunch, tea, and dinner, or supper. But lunch and tea were marked chiefly by the fact that at those times all the guests were sitting down and eating together. At other times there were merely lots of people eating and drinking continuously from 11 until 6.30 when the fireworks started. The fireworks were by Gandalf. They were not only brought by him, but designed and made by him, and the special effects, set pieces, and flights of rockets were left off by him. But there was also a generous distribution of squibs, crackers, sparklers, torches, dwarf candles, elf fountains, goblin barkers, and thunderclaps. They were all superb. The art of Gandalf improved with age. There were rockets like a flight of scintillating birds singing with sweet voices. There were green trees with trunks of dark smoke, their leaves open like a whole spring unfolding in a moment, and their shining branches dropped glowing flowers down upon the astonished hobbits, disappearing with a sweet scent just before they touched their upturned faces. There were fountains of butterflies that flew glittering into the trees. There were pillars of colored fires that rose and turned into eagles or sailing ships or a flannix of flying swans. There was a red thunderstorm and a shower of yellow rain. There was a forest of silver spears that sprang suddenly into the air with a yell like an embattled army and came down again into the water with a hiss like a hundred hot snakes. And there was also one last surprise. In honor of Bilbo, and it startled the hobbits exceedingly, as Gandalf intended, the lights went out, a great smoke went up. It shaped itself like a mountain seen in the distance and began to glow at the summit. It spouted green and scarlet flames. Out flew a red golden dragon, not life-size, but terribly lifelike. Fire came from his jaws and his eyes glared down. There was a roar and he whizzed three times over the heads of the crowd. They all ducked and many fell flat on their faces. The dragon passed like an express train, turning a somersault and burst over Bywater with a deafening explosion. That is the signal for supper, said Bilbo. The pain and alarm vanished at once, and the prostrate hobbits leapt to their feet. There was a splendid supper for everyone. For everyone, that is, except those invited to the special family dinner party. This was held in the great pavilion with the tree. The invitations were limited to twelve dozen, a number also called by the hobbits one gross, though the word was not considered proper to use of people. And the guests were selected from all the families to which Bilbo and Frodo were related, with the addition of a few special unrelated friends, such as Gandalf. Many young hobbits were included and present by parental permission, for hobbits were easygoing with their children in a matter of sitting up late, especially when there was a chance of getting them a free meal. Bringing up young hobbits took a lot of provender. There were many bagginses and boffins, and also many tooks and brandy bucks. There were various grubs, relations of Bilbo Baggins' grandmother, and various chubs, and a selection of burroas, bulgers, brace girdles, brock houses, good bodies, horn blowers, and proudfoots. Some of these were only very distantly connected with Bilbo, and some had hardly ever been in the Hobbiton before. As they lived in remote corners of the Shire, the Slackville Bagginses were not forgotten. Otho and his wife Lobelia were present. They disliked Bilbo and detested Frodo. But so magnificent was the invitation card written in gold ink that they had felt it was impossible to refuse. 
Besides, their cousin Bilbo had been specializing in food for many years, and his table had a high reputation.